What's going on? I'm Joey and today we're continuing how to make a Spider-Man phone film on zero budget. Welcome to part two and also the finale episode. Today we're going to be talking about the production and post-production. Let's get straight into it. So how did we find the location? With Lost Cause, obviously we had no budget, right? So we couldn't hire out locations. So most of the places we ever went was in exchange for a video, right? There's an amazing manor house in, in, in the set of Lost Cause and it's Harry Osborne's house. And I, I, I remember going up to him on the day like, hey, I'm making a film. Any chance we can just come in for like an hour or two. We don't have any money, but if you want a promo video or just pictures of, of, of your beautiful location, I happily just do that while we're shooting and like send them you if you want. They loved that and they accepted. There's not a lot of location heavy stuff in Lost Cause. It was just stuff we knew. So it was like, you know, all the school stuff was obviously in our university. Uh, if you see an alleyway, it was probably just us breaking into like an abandoned building or something. There was a lot of guerrilla shooting. Guerrilla shooting means um, when you're going somewhere without permission. And there was a lot of that. We didn't ask any permissions. We do, you know, if there was cool buildings, we'll be like, okay, right, they're leaving at six, so let's go at like 9 p.m. because no one's there. Back then, I really wanted to do a lot of green screen work, so I didn't go on any roofs. We left that for another world. The only thing that cost me a lot of money back then was the end scene. The 70 pound a day to rent out this community center. And that was huge for me because that was the only time where I was like, okay, I need to actually save up for this. I need to get a job and, you know, get 70 quid for these two days I need to shoot there. So that was the only time I actually forked over money for a location, but it was great, right? So it was it was ours for like six hours. We were able to use the lights, we were able to make something cool. And it was our first experience of like hiring a location and doing something properly. So it was like, I had to sign paperwork. We had to tell them what we was doing. We had to give them information of, you know, our characters and, and where we we're putting it. And it was a great experience for me because you know, it was, you know, it was the first time it was in a professional environment. It was the first time I was dealing with professional people. Number two, the gear we used. We filmed the whole of Spider-Man Lost Cause on this camera right here. This is the Canon 550D. Yeah, super interesting because that was my first camera and it was the first, no, my first proper camera and that was the camera we used for the whole of Lost Cause. This is the Nifty 50 and we filmed pretty much the whole of the film on this lens which is why it's so wobbly <laughs> we we knew nothing about cameras we knew nothing about anything back then which is kind of awful <laughs> no one was in university we we didn't realize that you know we needed to have get, get different lenses to tell different emotions we had to get different lenses to get different focal lenses. it was just something that we didn't register until the end of the film when you start seeing more wide shots uh, which is kind of a testament to andrew miles who was on camera because when it's just so zoomed in and and with these cameras i'm pretty sure they've got a two times crop sensor so it's probably 100 mil um it's also wobbly and like the film is obviously insanely wobbly but like the fact he was doing it the whole time and it wasn't that wobbly is amazing back then there was literally no lights um, because it just wasn't invented back then. I sound so old. Ten years ago now, I think Aperture were just starting out. So they were just learning how to do these LEDs. I remember being on set and it was night time and it was dark, we couldn't see anything. And I remember bringing my car around, putting the headlights on, putting the full beam on and putting my white t-shirt over the headlights and saying, there we go boys, there's some light. I, I remember that to this day, I'll never forget it because it's just how crazy the lens we went to make sure that just the film was lit, it was amazing. And then towards the end of the film, we got these little soft boxes um, that you could put little batteries in. And that was amazing because we started playing with color and yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Microphones, I had no idea. I remember it was a shotgun mic. I remember it was having a boom. Um, but other than that, I don't remember. I mean, we must have put it on the camera because the audio is not crazy good either. It's shooting, um, how we ended up getting together and shooting the film. And again, we spoke about earlier, it was just seen when we were free. We had our own private chat messages. I shared the script with everyone. I highlighted every single scene that was done. And I was like, hey guys, um, so scene one to 17 is done. Uh, 18 is ready. We need to go to the park for that. So if you guys are free, that's, the, that's how we did it. That's how we rolled and that's how um, yeah, we did it throughout the whole film. Highlighting the script really helped because we all had access to this script. 
So it was kind of like a little to-do list. Um, but again, there wasn't a lot of prep. Um, I don't think anyone actually read the scripts during the time. And uh, I was like, okay guys, we're shooting scene 73. Andrew was like, okay, cool, bring the camera, make sure everything's charged, and we just shoot it. Stunts. Um, it was us doing the stunts every single time. Um, if you see me jumping off something really high, I jumped off it. If you see Travis smashing into something, Travis definitely smashed into it. Um, there was even a time when I said to him, jump off this thing, but you don't need to land on it because I'm not going to see it. And he just did it. And he was like, yeah, I don't care. I did this. It's for the role. And I was like, you're not, you're not going to see it, mate. And he just went smack right into it. I always, I'll never forget it. I'll never forget that. And I, the final thing is if I can go back and do anything again, they had really cool cameras back at the uni. I wish we hired some of them out. I wish we hired better lenses out with the cameras, with the uni. Uh, but again, I think it was just anxiety of just asking for things. I have the weird thing about asking for things. So I got my own camera, I got my own lens and shot it myself. I wish I looked over the script more. Um, but yeah, these are things that, you know, coulda, shoulda, woulda. And these things that I wouldn't have learned if I didn't make the film. So are they things that change? I don't know. I don't think they are. I think they're just things I look back on as like, oh, I wish I wish I did that better, but without doing it, how would I know? It's a loophole. So if I remember correctly, the film took us about a year to shoot, but that's not, you know, 365 days of pure shooting. This was every other week, maybe, during the shoot, we all had girlfriends, we all did our own thing, we all had jobs, we all had work to do, right? So that's another thing without a budget. You're you as the director as the filmmaker you're on everyone else's time when you're when you've got a budget and this is the greatest thing about having a budget by you know you know hiring better kit and you know professionals is that everyone's on your time then you're the boss so you can you can be like hey right i need you this time 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 because you're paying them it's a job but when you don't have a budget you're on their time you go okay mate when are you free when are you free we'll try and like get this together and Hopefully we can be free together. That's the hardest thing about not having a budget, um, personally, I believe. And it's the one thing that will set your film back. Um, it will always set it back because if it's not a job and they're not getting paid, they have no obligation to be there. Obviously, obviously, if you've got your friends and family involved, they'll help as much as possible. But if they have a job they need to do, they have to go do that job. Like you are going to be the second thought, which is fine which is you know this that's how the world works and that's how we have to do it yeah that's the setback it's super hard but it's something you've got to learn to deal with and it's something you just got to learn to wipe off and go okay that's fine are you free the next day and if you're not then okay we'll just figure it out next week that's probably the hardest thing um about having a film with no budget this is the post-production segment now so this is everything after you've done the prep after you've done all the filming this is all the post-production so editing how did we edit the film? Um, we edited the film on Premiere Pro. I don't remember times it crashed, but I know for a fact it would have a million times. It would have took me another year to do, I think, Lost Cause was a three year process. We started working on it in 2011. We started writing it in 2012. To hold us 2012, we were filming it, and then we had editing it in 2013 get ready for 2014. The editing process was just me on my own. That's when I met Heath Gleason. Um, I remember putting trailers out at that point. He then messaged saying, hey, if you need any help, let me know. And I really needed help. So I was like, yeah, I'll let you know. And at that point he was making a film called Hero, which was a fan film he was making. So I already knew, I was like, I need to get you on this because number one, you're exactly like me. And number two, he was clearly very talented because of the things he was bringing out. I was like, yes, I need, I need that, I need that come on my film let's go let's do it together so at that point he became like a, a co-editor with me i'd say co-director because he also changed part of the films that just didn't work there was there was scenes that i was in it that i was adamantly keeping in like uh there was a whole scene with spider-man talking to captain america at the end but it just made no sense because captain america was english and like, he felt like what, what are you doing and i was like yeah that makes no sense yeah um, and we just cut it yeah, out he appears behind i him. was just like Gives yeah, I'll, I'll, I hold on. I'll, I'll act out the voiceover real quick. <laughs> I know who you are. <laughs> Stop! Don't turn around. Oh wait, never mind. I can't die. And then he just jumps <laughs> off. Never mind. Back. I was actually, if I had more time, I would have done the whole voiceover. I promise. Stuff like that, which I, I'm always so grateful for because he's so honest about this kind of stuff. But again, right, the editing was super simple. We used Premiere Pro, After Effects for the uh, After Effects stuff, and that's about it. The visual effects. Visual effects was tough right the whole point of barney was that he was supposed to go into shadow so as soon as 
which is why the ending makes no sense why Spider-Man is just grabbing all these lights is because he's trying to fill the room with light so that Barney can't disappear but we never explained that and Heath mentioned that Barney's power would be so much better if he could just like vanish like Mysteria right where he has green smoke it'll be a lot more visually pleasing it'll be a lot better it'll, it'll just look cooler you know it's just it's just something we can visually see and I always agreed with that and I think it's amazing and it really elevated the film for us especially the ending uh, but it made a lot of things not make sense towards the end. Uh, this, at this point, we, I uh, met someone called Jimmy, who helped on Another World. Um, he did all the insanely cool CGI stuff. And, and at that point, it was all fully CGI. So he did the end swing, all the middle stuff. Jimmy, again, is this incredible um, CGI artist. He's an animator who, again, is doing some amazing stuff, just like everyone else on this on this film. Um, I reached out to him because I just I told myself it's a Spider-Man film right? you need some cool CGI shots and I, I can't remember how I found Jimmy it must have been like a just like how I find composers I must have just found animation reels and saw Jimmy and was like hey Jimmy I love your reel I'm very sure he did a Spider-Man reel and I was like we need that in the film um, as you can see by the film we didn't do a lot of crazy VFX stuff so let's talk about the music. Again, I used Yashka Hadiki, who was an amazing, who is an amazing German composer. So how did I send him the footage? What I did, which is kind of annoying for him, I guess, um, what I'd do is send him 20 minute chunks. And I'd say, hey, uh, Yashka, we've done this 20 second, 20 minute chunk. Can you please compose that? Um, and then send it back. And then I'll send you another 20 minute chunk, which, you know, for me is great, right? I get to see what it looks like, see what it sounds like give him changes if needed and then you know send him another part he came back with a genuine masterpiece it genuinely is like such an amazing score and i'll never forget it the only inspiration i gave him was Hans zimmer and always cloudy with a chance of meatballs <laughs> that's the only inspiration i gave him and he came up with this amazing theme song and these amazing tunes and the night scene was all the night scene in there i love the night scene and he sprinkled that everywhere on the film but again, I sent him 20 minute chunks and I gave him a, a document of tones and, and feelings I want through this montage, right? I'd, I'd put a timestamp of 001. I want this to seem a bit, you know, ambient. 10 minutes in, uh, Spider-Man gets a little bit more happy. So let's just make the music more chirpy. Add 90s theme here. I did this, right? And this, this, this allowed him to understand what I'm thinking, but also it will give him the freedom to create his own because I'm not being too brief. I think it was a good way, but you know, you shouldn't really give them 20 minute chunks, you should give them the whole film and then they compose it. Again, there was a ton of deleted scenes. I think Lost Cause actually ended up being three hours long. After seeing three hour long cuts, me and Heathrow like, yeah, this is way too long. We need to cut at least like half an hour. We should have cut like one and a half hours looking back. But you know, we both didn't know what we were doing. We were both just like, this is cool. We're making spam my film. Let's just do a cool film. There's a few normal Osborne scenes that also didn't work. Um, I actually don't remember them and I also lost the hard drive which had all the footage on it which I guess is another tip back up your footage because if you lose it this will gone. Lost Cause, the Lost Cause footage has now gone forever I can't look back at the memories I can't look back at any scenes any deleted scenes it's all gone which is insanely sad um, uploading the film <laughs> that took ages oh my god I remember it taking five hours uh, this is another tip I'll give you because it happened in another world as well something I learned from it YouTube or wherever you're putting it will need to process your film. Uh, it will take, if it's a two hour long film, it will take 10 hours to process. Do not announce the film until it's, until it's uploaded, at least. The aftermath of the film. Uh, the aftermath was insane. Uh, the first week it got 200 views. That was amazing. And then it jumped to 10, then it jumped to a million. And then it jumps to 2 million, and now we're sat here at 16 million views. Um, Spider-Man Lost Colors used to be the most viewed fan film ever in existence. Uh, I don't know if it still is, this, you know, this fan film's coming out every day now, every week, and they're so good. So it's probably, it's probably not even close. Spider-Man Lost Colors is still the most viewed fan film in the world. Uh, which is insane. Most viewed Spider-Man fan film in the world. It, it, it gives me so much happiness that that is the case because we had no idea what we were doing. We are doing it for the love and the passion and we did it with no money, with no gear. And it's the most viewed Spider-Man fan film on YouTube. What would I do differently? I wish I just learned my craft a little bit better before I started. I wish I had a finished script because that would make the film a little way more, a way more coherent. 
watching it. I wish that I directed everyone a little bit better. I mean, you know, all these things are diminishing returns. People in the films aren't actors. Um, that that they don't know their craft as, as much as me. I, I didn't know my craft. But it would have been nice if I just spent more time, you know, talking about the scene, talking about the motivations, talking about the characters, talking about what I want for the future of the film. I, I, I wish I had money. <laughs> I wish I had money. I wish, I wish I could have paid people. I really do. To this day, I really do. And what would I do the same? I would do pretty much everything the same, right? Um, the people I use, everyone is still friends to this day. I love every single one of them. Um, the VFX, it was amazing at the time. It really was like watching that back then was gobsmacking. And it's, it's crazy that Jimmy on his own with the help of Heath with his After Effects magic was able to create that end swing shot. Like I, to this day, like how did we do that a decade ago? Right guys, uh, I, will, I will not take any more of your time. Again, I know this is an insanely long video. I really appreciate you sticking all the way here if you have. Um, if there is any questions, please leave them in the description. I'll answer every single one. Um, if anyone's, you know, a first time filmmaker or want to make a, a, a Spider-Man fan film or just want to make films in general, let me know. I'm so excited to see everyone's creations. And um, if there is anything here that you want me to go more in depth in later on down the line, please let me know. Um, I will be doing one with Another World as well because, you know, we changed a lot um, in them four years. Uh, and this whole process changed, like the suit making, the production, it was so much more prepared and the cameras, the technology, everything was kind of crazy. Uh, the jump to another world was amazing um, and it would be great to talk about that as well. So if you want that as well, please let me know. Like I said at the beginning of the video, we are in this new era now where, you know, fan films are getting funded. People are getting 10,000 to 50,000 to 100,000 to create their projects. And it's no lie that these projects look higher up than everyone else's. They get more support, they get more love, they get more clout, which is, which, you know, which makes sense, right? They, they look higher valued. Uh, the costumes look better, the cinematography looks better, but that all comes with money, right? Of course you does. Like, filmmaking in general is like the rich man's game. It really is. It, it, it's tough to do on a budget, but I do hope that these series of videos have helped just one person to show you, hey, look, all you gotta do is grab a camera, grab a friend and create. And it's possible. Uh, me and my friends made this film and it is out there in the world being viewed by 60 million people. It's not the best thing in the world. It's not the worst thing in the world, but we've done it. I guess the conclusion is if everyone goes into the mindset thinking, I want to make a Spider-Man fan film, but I need a hundred thousand pounds to do this, then I'm just going to wait for that money to come and then I'll make it. Because not a lot of people are donating. Because not everyone in the world is going to donate. If you can get funding, amazing. I want funding, so I don't blame you. But if you don't have funding, don't wait for that money because it's just going to limit your passion. It's going to limit your creativity. It's going to limit the world of seeing your ideas. Just get a camera and go. Just do it. Anyway, this is a super long-winded outro. Thank you for watching part one and two. I really hope you picked something up from this, even if it's something small. If you want me to elaborate on any of the categories that I've already said, please don't hesitate to comment down below and I'll make sure to answer every single one for you. Don't forget to thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe and all that good stuff. My videos stay on during sex. I said it the first time, I was like, yeah, I'm going to say that every single time, but now I feel like weird, I feel just weird about it. Kids are watching my content. Kids are watching my content.